Why don't you just love computers? And welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I am Jeff Cliff in the midst of technical difficulties trying to respond to people while I'm live broadcasting. Yes, I am in fact just starting my weekly broadcast slash podcast slash record of the time. This is Facebook, 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 my good lord. Yeah, you definitely can't reply to streams without playing videos. That is terrible. But the point of this show is to be an alternative to the RIA, the MPAA, the IFPI, Netflix, John Gormley, and other corporate media. And what you just heard was a couple of songs. We had, uh, most recently, Porn on Betas, Disconnected, which is off of one of their albums that was a pretty good album. I think this that was the web release, the newest album. I probably came out in like 2004. And then, of course, prior to that is our theme song, which is the Toka Collective. That's right. Uh, I knew I had that one wrong. But uh, And then before that, there was Triad with the final rewind which Triad, of course, if you haven't downloaded all of their albums, please go and do it, because not only are they free to download and share with your friends, but they're all really good. So uh, please go and do that after this show. But in addition to that, after this show, if you are listening to this broadcast and you have not gone through and listened and watched my 120 video long series, you reach out 120, that's kind of hard to say. There's one video in specific I'd like to make sure that you do watch. So if you're watching this after it has been broadcast sometime in the future, pause this video and go and watch the argument from back in one. I will link to that later. It is one of the early ones and it is going to be a prerequisite for this show. So please go and watch that if you have not and you're watching in the future. But uh, other little notes that I have to, before we get into the meat of the show, uh, a couple of shows back, I put the knives into Adder Shear for the wrong thing. I made a mistake. I'm not perfect. This is a weekly broadcast and part of the reason why it is a weekly broadcast and not just like one show or a show whenever I feel like it, when I have the material to produce a well-reasoned essay, perhaps like the Occulte Veritatis podcast. I mean, their format is really good and cool and you should go possibly listen to them too, but podcasts like that and shows like that have a different rhythm to them. I am something close to real time. When you hear me, especially live on Sundays, you're getting the raw stuff from what I can perceive in the world and I rely on the rest of the world, you, the listeners, and people out there to correct me if I am wrong. And part of the value of having a weekly show is that you can be corrected. And in this case, I was uh, at least a little bit incorrect. Uh, Andrew Shear did not take taxpayer dollars when he paid for his children's private schooling. He paid using conservative party funds. That is a mistake uh, that a lot of people I think were making at the time, and I probably picked it up off of someone else who was making it. My mistake. I should have vetted that a little bit more before believing it, but it is a mistake that I have made. So it is still uh, corruption, and it's still the kind of thing that if Sheer actually would live up to his own personal beliefs as espoused in the, the past, he should still pay the money that he said that he would have to pay or basically do the time, as it were, for, for that crime, because it is basically a crime to do that. It was handled internal to the Conservative Party, and from the sounds of it, they've dealt with it, etc. But it is still worth considering that it was a wrong thing for him to do, but it was not the thing that I thought that he did, and probably a lot of people thought, and certainly all the people who listened to me probably thought after I said it. So it is also worth considering, though, that the Conservative Party actually does get taxpayer dollars and did in the past and continues to do so. Maybe not as much since Harper killed the per vote tax subsidy. However, there's still subsidies out there and you still have stuff like in Alberta right now where the provincial government's conservative party there has been relying on federal subsidies that are COVID related. I'm not going to go too much into the detail there, but there there are taxpayer dollars involved. It's just not a direct taking of those taxpayer dollars. So there's more than enough taxpayer dollars that you can imagine like there's a big pot and the taxpayer dollars went in, his hands went in, the money went out. You can see it that way, but it is also reasonable to see it the other way that taxpayer dollars were only sort of kind of involved and that he didn't technically steal taxpayer dollars. So that is something worth pointing out. And I'm sorry I made that mistake. I will try to not 
to make that kind of mistake in the future. But like I said, correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm making a mistake, leave comments. Say, hey, Jeff, you got this wrong. Hey, Jeff, you're making a mistake when you're linking to this uh, source. This source is garbage. I know SAS boy, oh, you're out there somewhere. You do that a lot. You can keep doing that. I'm okay with that. I, I'll disagree with you, but that kind of feedback is a healthy part of a show like this. So that being said, and speaking of sources that are beyond questionable, the first thing I want to talk about today, uh, because we don't have any guests today, so it's going to be another show of just me rambling, is going to be Zero Hedge's article, Nuclear Brinkmanship is Back. Putin okays nukes in response to conventional attacks. Now, I've talked in previous shows about the slow transition away from a world that we had in the late 1980s, where the Cold War ended and right before the Cold War ended, where the United States and the Soviet Union at the time, and Russia after that, signed a whole bunch of treaties that allowed for the rest of the world to have a little bit of a sigh of relief that maybe we're not going to go into nuclear war right away. I mean, we still have these giant arsenals of weapons that can destroy the world and end the human species, but at least we have agreements of how to deal with disagreements and when emotions start getting out of hand, there's a process. There's a at least paper in the way and people who are acting based on the rules set down and agreed upon by both major nuclear powers that, oh hey, we're not just going to nuke each other at the drop of a pin. There are steps towards that happening that have to happen first. Now obviously, if the United States just up and decides to start shooting its missiles, the Russians are going to start shooting back and then the nuclear war starts. But it has, up until fairly recently, it had to get to that point. Either the treaties had to be torn up and then some kind of international crisis happened and then an attack of some kind had to happen and then nuclear war would happen. Well, now let's take a look at the world we are living in this week. One, we have a series of international crises. Not just one international crisis, but many international crises that are starting to compound on each other. We have the, in the United States especially, cities are on fire. Crowds and mobs of multiple political leanings are now meeting in the streets in open pitched battles. We have giant warehouses like the Amazon warehouse uh, that are being lit on fire and burned to the ground that are causing billions of dollars of damage, I'm sure, and certainly a significant dent in the productive capacity of the United States of America alone. This is just the states. Protests are spreading all over the world now. We have all kinds of unrest that has been bottled down and bottled down and bottled down and is exploding. And this is one of the things that can lead to an escalation of violence and an escalation of other things happening. Now, unrest alone, that is not the thrust of what's going on here. As mentioned, there were treaties. There were treaties that the United States and Russia slash the Soviet Union had signed to make sure that the amount of nuclear weapons in the world was limited, that the slow tapering off of the amount of destructive capability of these two entities. But as mentioned in previous videos, a lot of those treaties, if not all of the important ones by now have been torn up. And so we no longer have the treaties to defend us from complete and total nuclear annihilation. We can't bank on that or bet on that anymore. They're not there. And a lot of people are still taking for granted that, oh, hey, we at least somebody is responsible for keeping this from happening. But again, as mentioned in previous video, that somebody has a name. Actually, there are two, probably two somebodies at this point, probably a little bit more complicated on the Russian side. But in the United States side, there is one name specifically that keeps the world from going to nuclear war. And that name, of course, is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the only person in the United States that can or cannot push the button. And that is a, again, just the world we are currently living in. Now, given how much violence he has been willing to put into repressing the Black Lives Matter slash justice for George Floyd protests, I'll let you make up your mind on how uh, safe and stable of a situation that is. But now we get to this article here, where up until now, fairly recently, the United States and the Russian side both had rules that decided when nuclear war starts. And the rule had been, up until fairly recently, that both sides had to be either attacked or some other reason had to be there for nuclear war to start. Fairly recently, Donald Trump has changed it so that the United States will respond to a conventional, i.e. non-nuclear attack, with nuclear weapons. So, for example, if there is an attack on NATO forces in Eastern Europe by Russian tank regiments or whatever, uh, that would be cause for a nuclear war to start. And that, again, was only on the American side. The Russians still had this rule that, in at least on paper, that they would not 
respond to a attack with nuclear weapons unless the attack itself was nuclear in nature. But now, quote, Russia has, quote, for over the past year, it seems like every month has witnessed Washington and Moscow upping the ante on nuclear weapons rhetoric, which has been accompanied by the breakdown of key treaties, including the uh, recently the landmark Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, and more lately, the open skies, now with even new start on the chopping block. Russia has vowed that for each time Washington has moved the goalposts in terms of backing off of prior policies of nuclear weapons restraint, it would respond in kind. This also, as the Trump administration has gone so far as to reportedly seriously consider restarting nuclear tests, which hasn't been done in three decades plus. And there's good reasons why we're not doing open air nuclear tests anymore, because it actually impacts the world, the entire world in multiple ways. One, that you can actually measure how much radioactive material has come from those tests. And everyone born after about 1963 has been impacted by that. There are, I mean, it's not a huge impact. There's some people dying of cancer who wouldn't normally die. There's some people getting cancer who wouldn't normally get cancer. And there's little impacts like that, but it's actually measurable. You can, if you have the right kind of sensitive equipment, know how much of your body has been impacted by the cesium or whatever the, the isotopes are that, that came from those particular tests. And two, it impacted the climate. There was enough nuclear testing that we can actually measure in the climate record over the 20th century. So if we're talking about restarting these tests and making some more things like the SAR Bomba, which again is a total consequence of restarting nuclear tests, is we're going to start building bigger and bigger and bigger bombs again, just like we did in the 20th century, it's going to have a bigger and bigger and bigger impact on the climate. Now, that said, could we use a little bit of extra cooling in the climate right now? Probably a little bit. I mean, there, there is an argument to be made of using nuclear weapons to geoengineer the world and the, the climate, but we really, really have to be careful when we're doing that sort of thing. So, continuing on. Quote, Putin appears to be making good on reciprocal threats. On Tuesday, signing into effect a new nuclear policy allowing Russia to use nukes in response to conventional arms attacks. It is essentially a clear rejection of the no first use policy, blah, 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 blah. So it's basically mirroring the United States, serving as a warning to the United States to not go further, and quote, it is now dangerously close to a nuclear brinkmanship scenario, which once witnessed Americans having to huddle into bomb shelters on fears of imminent apocalyptic nuclear destruction. Of course, bomb shelters are not going to help you, might keep you alive a little bit, but good luck with that. So, uh, and as a reminder, amid this extremely dangerous escalation with apparently no off ramp, we are assured for years by Russiagate advocates that Trump is some kind of Russian puppet in the White House, yet at every step he's, he's in reality worse and relations with Moscow. So that's kind of an interesting vantage point from the obviously in pro-Russia zero hedge. But are you hearing about this? Is your media source talking about this? Have you heard of this this week? If you have not heard about this this week, there is a problem because this is a major change in the policy that directly affects every single man, woman, and child on this planet. And this is this week. This tweet, the last tweet here is from June 2nd. So it is not a minor little detail in a public policy that it affects just the people in Russia. It is not a thing that just affects the people in the United States. This is a major cause for concern, something that all governments, all governments around the world should actually be meeting. And I mean, I mean, we can get into a little bit about how that this is going to impact governments and COVID in a bit. But I mean, this is a serious crisis now we are in when both the United States and the Putin in Russia are openly talking about taking steps to get closer to nuclear war. That's a huge deal, especially, again, in light of the fact that we have the kind of unrest in the United States right now that can lead to civil war. In other countries where this sort of thing has happened, it has led to civil war. When the military is used on the public of the United States, I mean, that is a exact type of scenario that can lead. It doesn't have to lead to civil war, but it can. The places like in Ukraine, I mean, maybe not Google, but like look up other color revolutions, revolutions that were started by the CIA in order to overthrow governments around the world, democratically elected or otherwise. This is following pretty much in the exact kind of steps that you would expect of a color revolution to take. And so what does that mean? What, what would a civil war in the United States mean? Well, it would mean that it could escalate to conventional warfare. Civil wars can escalate to conventional warfare. And then when that happens, if the Russians are involved, again, which you probably expect they could be, how many people think that Donald Trump is basically an agent of the Russians? One of our guests, even in the past couple of weeks, have alluded to that sort of thing. So we are really, really playing with fire right now in the States and around the world and governments, I haven't heard of the Canadian government addressing this. 
I haven't heard of the Saskatchewan government addressing this. This is something that should have been addressed like the day of in a big way. And if your media is not covering this, that is a big problem. But it isn't the only thing going on. It is something that has been kind of building up for a while. But it's, again, not the only thing that has been building up for a while. This is next thing is from CBC. And I don't really like linking to CBC all that much. But this one, I mean, it is covering the crown. So it's kind of really their job to cover this sort of thing. So, quote, Saskatchewan First Nations request $100 million U.S., to build their own PP stockpile. So uh, at first when I saw this, it was portrayed as a sort of First Nations just asking for money, which, I mean, that this is going to be part of negotiations with the provincial government on and on and on and off and on and off. And so there are people on the Cree Nation side who that's their job is to ask for money. And it's the Saskatchewan government's job to give them that money and to negotiate with them and to come to an agreement and so on and so forth. But that's not actually what this is about. So I'm going to continue, keep going. But I just wanted to like uh, preface this that if you're expecting that's what this is about, be ready to be surprised. So continuing, quote, James Smith, Cree Nation chief, wrote to the Queen asking her to uphold treaty relationship. Quote, Saskatchewan First Nations have made $120 million U.S. request to Indigenous Services Canada, ISC, to build up their own personal protective equipment stockpiles in preparation for a second wave of COVID-19, according to the chief of the community, which has led the development of a plan. James Smith, Cree Nation's chief, Willie Burns, said his community in partnership with the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, the FSIN, which represents 74 First Nations in Saskatchewan, has lined up his supplier to provide all First Nations in the province with surgical masks, glove, and sanitizer, but said IC has been non-committal about the proposal. So pausing there for a second. One, it's kind of interesting that it's in U.S. dollars, isn't it? Is that because the Canadian supply chain is not performing well enough for them that they have to go to the States? Is it because the equipment that's available in Canada is not up to their standards or they don't trust it? Or what's going on there? That's kind of an interesting detail that CBTC doesn't really highlight all that much. But continuing on, Byrne said the First Nations can't rely exclusively on the federal government's personal protective equipment PPE supply because it has been beset by a litany of problems, including failed shipments and shortages that have flared throughout the first months of the pandemic. A quote, we have to make sure our people are looked after in regards to their being or well-being as a person, and we have to protect those in need. I want to know why Canada can't say they're helping us buying or partnering with a company to purchase PPE. It's harmful, i.e. so Canada's dropping the ball, they're doing it themselves, which good on them. Like they're trying to make these arrangements to have personal protective equipment for the people that they're responsible for, right on. I mean, I wish our provincial government was more on the ball on that kind of topic. So quote, according to the proposal FSIN is giving $120 million US over six months to build up a stockpile of 19 million surgical masks, 58.4 million gloves, 170,000 face shields, 146,000 liters of hand sanitizer per month. Holy cow, that's a lot. But quote, the supplies would be distributed to the communities to prepare for the reopening of the provincial economies and the expected second wave of the pandemic. Now, they said, hold on here. So let's see, Smith Cree Nation. Let's, let's actually, the CBC doesn't have a map. So let's find out exactly where it is nation is. Uh, Wikipedia says bordering the municipalities of Camistino and Torch River. So we are in way up in the... So it is in Saskatchewan, for those who are not following along, the main outbreaks that are going on right now for COVID-19 are in the north, northern Saskatchewan. Now, are they near this particular part of the north? That part, I don't know. Obviously, they're concerned enough to be asking for masks. But it is way up there in the north. So, quote, supplies would be distributed to communities to prepare for the opening. Byrne said the proposal from the FSIN was sent to the ISC about a week ago. He said time is ticking to line up the supplies before the events outtake the communities. So the COVID is spreading. The provincial government is opening up the province. And the expected consequence of that is there's going to be more spreading. And there's going to be more spreading in the areas that are already currently affected, which is, of course, the north. And the north have a bunch of other problems that are going to compound this issue. So they are trying to deal with it. And so, quote, time is of the essence. In regards to the whole pandemic, time is not going to stand still, said Burns, whose community has has recorded one COVID-19 case to date. Uh, It's a little bit of uh, horse bargaining here. Uh, Quote, so here's the, the important part. Quote, chief says treaties medicine chest clause needs to be respected. Burns said that the federal government has a treaty obligation to provide for funding for the proposal under the pestilence and medicine chest clauses in some of the numbered treaties, including Treaty 6, which covers the James 
Smith Cree Nation territory. He appealed directly to Queen Elizabeth in a letter requesting that she intervene under the treaties signed by her representatives. The Queen responded in a May 6th letter written by her deputy correspondence coordinator, Jenny Vine, or Vine, that Burns should reach out to the Governor General Julie Payette and federal ministers with his request. Nevertheless, the Queen sends her warm wishes to you and your people during this current situation, said the letter. Burns then followed up with the letter to Payette, requesting her office engage with this community on the issue. Our peoples have been hit by an unforeseen event that was contemplated. Folks, this is the key part here. Quote, was contemplated at the time of the treaty making, said Burns in a letter to Governor General Julie, Julie Payette. Burns said the treaty relationship is a living, breathing commitment requiring Canada to continually uphold its end of the deal. Payette's office did not respond to a request for comment from the CBC. So what is going on here? The thing that allows Saskatchewan to exist, the thing that allows Canada to have people living on Cree land is the numbered treaties. The numbered treaties is an, like Treaty 6, are agreements that mean that the settlers can be on the land and there are things that the nations who sign the treaties get in response. And those things tended to have not been very valuable in the long run. I don't, again, know the full details of all the numbered treaties. I haven't read all the numbered treaties. I know some of them may even, there's there's details that the public may not even know about these numbered treaties, but the things that were important 150 odd years ago tended not to be all that important going forward. They tended to be not really the best deals that you can imagine for the First Nations side. They were a little one-sided, to put it lightly, in favor of the Canadian government, or at least the British Crown and their representatives. And so when there's a clause like this that really isn't applicable almost ever, like when is there a pestilence going through the land? How often has that happened in Canadian history? How many times have we been faced with a pandemic of this kind? It has happened before. The 1918 flu would be one case. There was a case in the late 19th century that would have impacted Canada as well. Winston Churchill wrote a poem about it. That would have been one example. So like really, you can count these things on one hand, the number of times where it's ever been an issue. And it is an issue right now. And so if the number of treaties included this medicine chest part of them, that it really should be respected. It really is important for us to live up to our side, our side being the settler side, of the deal. And when our government is not living up to the really, really basic, easy to implement parts of the number of treaties, it is really not a good thing and it is going to cause problems later on when we try to work together with the nations to solve other problems. They're going to point to this happening right now today as a short-term issue that has to be dealt with at the time and not just pushed off. And they will say, you didn't live up to your side of the bargain. We're not going to live up to our side of the bargain. That is going to come if we don't live up to our side of the bargain. So it's a very important thing, again, to put pressure on the Sask party. I know they're probably not going to budge on this, but it's something to keep in mind, especially as we head into the next election season, to put pressure on all the parties to say, will you live up to these number of treaties? Because if this sort of thing happens again, can we rely on the whatever party in question to actually do something about it? So uh, continuing on, there, as kind of mentioned in the past video and mentioned in a little bit ago here, there are little rebellions going on all over the United States. There are all kinds of people making choices and conducting action and going out in the street and doing things that impact other people. And this is at a general level. Like this is a level at which I'm not merely referring to the protesters here. I'm talking about the cops, the protesters, the people staying at home. Everyone right now is making choices and there are going to be consequences of those choices. And some of those choices are going to impact other people. And not all of those impacts are going to be positive. As mentioned in the previous video, we are still having this COVID crisis and one of the expected consequences of having a ongoing global pandemic and having large numbers of masses of people meeting in these streets is there's going to be a spread of COVID. It, there's lots of reasons to expect this. One of the reasons is merely the chemicals that the police are using to disperse crowds is going to cause people to have problems breathing. And then those people are going to go to the hospital. Those people are going to have a reduced capacity to deal with further reductions in their ability to breathe. And this is just like one little tidbit, one little nugget of things that are causing 
causing problems relating to COVID. But regardless of how the next week plays out, and regardless of how many people are impacted, there are people making choices to ignore people in their life who are telling them this is going to be your impact of your choice. And they are now starting to use this kind of rhetoric here. Quote, let's be clear about something. If there's a spike in coronavirus cases in the next two weeks, don't blame the protesters, unquote. Now, they have something that they want you to blame this on. And that something is an abstract concept and we could get into that and in fact i actually invited people who have been arguing with this all week about but when we stop blaming the people who are actually acting for the consequences of their actions that is a problem it is a problem when we who act can't accept responsibility for our own actions and when people cannot be held accountable for their own actions and yes, people in government have a little bit of a higher responsibility to do things like prevent the spread of COVID. People who have businesses, especially large businesses like Walmart, have a responsibility, a larger responsibility than the individual person out there in terms of preventing the spread of COVID. But individuals who are going out and choosing to expose others, potentially or otherwise, to this lethal pathogen, they should take responsibility for that act. Maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's something that is important enough to them that they have to make that call and they have to endanger those lives that they're endangering. Great. Take responsibility. Own up to it. Accept that what you are doing has this consequence. Don't just blame the the, the systematic racism or whatever other abstract idea you want to blame. Take responsibility for your own actions. So, and continuing along that line, quote, this one from the Toronto Sun, the lockdowns in Canada are over whether public health officials know it or not. Quote, I've been breaking the rules since the start, despite officials recommending against it. I've been dividing my time between rural Ontario and downtown Toronto, regularly going back and forth. Ooh. Of course, we kind of expect that out of people who are writing for the Toronto Sun, maybe just a little bit, that they are that much of a jerk that they would do that, but continuing on. It's what we felt we had to do as a family to maintain our sanity as a household with multiple small children. Uh, I know I'm not the only one, and I don't just mean in regards to this specific rule. Uh, da, da, da. And then they, they make the claim that Canadian ICUs were never overwhelmed and cases continue to trend downward, which isn't actually, I mean, it's true in Saskatchewan, but is it true in Canada? Let's actually take a look. Uh, what are the current stats for COVID today? We have just under 7 million confirmed cases and just over 400,000 deaths. But that's globally. That's not really the Canada context. Let's see about Canada specifically. 97,000 cases. And the daily cases have been going down. Okay, so they've been trending down. We do seem to be on the right side of the curve. So that part, okay, Toronto Sun is uh, correct on that. Uh, the cases continue to trend downwards. All the while, the rules continue to be broken. Now, not all the rules have continued to be broken. Yes, there are people breaking the rules, but there are some that are still more or less being listened to. As of at least this past week, the schools are still closed. We're not seeing football games. We're not seeing hockey games. The major sources of spreading, for the most part, have not been operating, but we'll keep going on this one. Quote, it's been two weeks since the country lost its collective mind about hundreds of young people gathering in Toronto's Trinity Bellwoods Park, and it doesn't seem like that caused an outbreak. Uh, quote, and when I say everyone is doing it, I mean everyone. That includes Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Ontario Premier Doug Ford, Toronto Mayor John Tory, and other officials. The hypocrisy of this is, was annoying, and the way that they all skated from the consequences reeked of how the powers that be feel the rules are just for the little people, but it was also hard to blame them. The fact that senior politicians all broke one or two of the rules says more about the excessiveness of the rules than it does about those breaking them. Quote, they probably did what the rest of it, us have been doing. They took a look at the situation and decided that what was and wasn't safe for them. We've had months where the news has almost ex exclusively been about COVID-19 and we've been gobbling it up. There are a few low information voters out there right now. People who would usually be preoccupied with sports scores are now reading the, on the latest vaccine trials, the role of viral loads in infection rates and how other countries are handling things. Pause. This is great, by the way. I love this part. Like, this is one of the good things about COVID, is that there's, he's right, Anthony Fury. There are millions of people out there that are actually, like, opening their mind a little bit beyond the buzz of sports and a distraction, at least as far as 
actually trying to understand the world around them go and hopefully some of those will like stay outside of that and do things like go back into learning about how the world works around them after sports turns back on and keep from being distracted about that it is a good thing that we're actually using our brains for something that actually impacts the world rather than just pushing a ball back and forth on our grass field but continuing on then there are mounting calls from the medical specialists who are urging the lockdowns to be lifted on the basis that they're now doing more harm than good that is no doubt influencing people's thinking I'm sure the Toronto Sun uh, really wants to push that. I, I would caution those hearing that. Really, really take a look to see whether it is actually, in fact, doing more harm than good. But don't just believe the Toronto Sun's offhand comment on that. But continuing on. For postponed surgeries, rising alcoholism, deaths of despair. These are all rising, even as COVID-19 cases decline. Pause. Deaths of despair is declining in a lot of places. Not all places are going up, but whatever. Continuing. Some people have likely decided that they just can't take it anymore and are willing to roll the dice and risk getting the virus. Perhaps the biggest factor that is going to change the perspectives on the lockdowns is the series of anti-racism protests and riots that have happened across North America. While individuals are being told that they can't visit dying loved ones in hospitals or attend their funerals, officials are giving implicit nod to mass protests in our streets. Quote, in terms of the demonstrations, I cannot control people's activities, BC's uh, Bonnie Henry said the other day. Quote, what I can do is provide you with the necessary advice and tools you need to have a peaceful demonstration in a way that is not going to imperil your family, your loved ones, your community during this time, during this pandemic. Pause. BC can't control people's activities? Hold on. They were certainly trying to control the wet sweatens activities. That is definitely not true. They are willing to use police violence when it suits them. That's for sure. So... Dr. Henry's own provincial rules stipulates no gatherings of over 50 people, which some of these demonstrations, even in Canada, are well over 50, and certainly in BC. Quote, there have already been thousands of social distancing tickets issued. I've watched as Toronto cops on horseback have patrolled the beaches of Toronto to inexplicably demand people get off the sand and move on to the grass, which is kind of interesting how people have been dealing with water because there's all kinds of really contradictory rules on some say you can go into the water but can't sit on the beach some say you can go into the beach but can't go into the water obviously these in Toronto it's you can be on the grass but not on the beach but whatever continuing on Anthony DeMonte Ottawa's general manager of emergency and protective services said a few days ago that the protest was an exceptional circumstance and that while the city wasn't endorsing the event it made clear that they wouldn't be issuing fines to attendees and da, da, da. so they kind of go into this again and a little bit of the consequences here I think that's about the extent of this article but the the point here is that what's going to happen here in Canada this is this is not applicable to the states by the way the states can have their own legal system them, their own interpretation of what's going on and their own version of events and whatever that that's fine uh, the people who are on the streets they're making their choices they're gonna have to deal with and live with their responsibilities of and consequences of their choices but here in Canada there is still a little bit of a rule of law here and when you have a large group of people that are blankly ignoring a law and the law is not being enforced on them what's going to happen is that when other people start to no longer social distance and start to come into the streets for other purposes perhaps protesting against COVID protection measures perhaps maybe a football game and riding over a football game, God knows we've done enough of that in our country's history, to hockey and football games, these kinds of tickets are not going to stick anymore, or at least are at huge risk of not sticking anymore. So the the mechanisms we have, at least at the government level, to make sure that people are abiding by this attempt to protect Canadians and to protect people around the world from Canadians and to get a handle on this global pandemic, all of that is now lost. All of that is now going out the wayside. All of that is being dropped like some kind of a glass vase from our hand and shattering against the floor. We have lost the solidarity at the federal, the provincial, the city level, the neighborhood level perhaps. All of it is just shattered. We have lost our ability to work together as a nation to address the, one of the biggest threats that we've had in our nation's history. Well done, people on the streets. Well done. Thank you for that. Comment from the peanut gallery. Quote, I've been quarantining for before going to the protest, and I'll remain quarantined after. You left out the part of the meme that contained the crowded beaches for Memorial Day. The point is that the protests aren't the only gatherings happening, so when they only blame the protests, this is disingenuous. That's a good point. Uh, there, are, At least in the States, uh, there are probably other crowded places. 
Um, I have seen Florida specifically continue to have their beaches open. Uh, and it's not just the states, of course. We are all opening up. And as pointed out in this article, people are coming out of their houses. People are starting to socially interact. People are starting to think that the rules no longer apply and that the pandemic is over. And I mean, to an extent, it's understandable why they think that. Saskatchewan cases have been nowhere close to what the SHA has said, as pointed out by a couple of people on Facebook threads this week. We have this problem that people don't see the seriousness in some areas. And in other areas, especially in the healthcare and people who are closely related to the healthcare workers, they do see the issue and they do see it firsthand. And so I want to, I know we're kind of getting near the end of the show, but I want to get to two other very important things that happened this week. First is, quote, medical workers fighting COVID say cops are attacking them. Quote, you picked the wrong time. And so this article goes into how nurses and other hospital workers who are just trying to get home are being tear gassed are being beaten, are being, uh, let's see if any of them have been arrested here. They tried to stay out of the way, but even when they complied to what the police told them to do, even when they're uh, not involved in the protest, even when they're just trying to mind their own business and do their job, get home so they can get some rest, so that they can get back to keeping people from dying from COVID, the police in the States are just generally violent enough and non-picky enough of who they are directing their violence against that they are attacking these nurses and other uh, hospital workers here. So they talk about some of the witnesses here, talk about some of the GoFundMe and quote, some have been hit with rubber bullets. We have one picture of one guy who's just like covered in blood. I actually saw this guy's account a little bit earlier and how he's like very calm about the whole thing. And he's like, I just want to do my job sort of thing. I just want to get back to helping people. Quote, uh, this is actually kind of a long article. Don't want to get into the full details here because we're kind of out of time. But long story short, it is really not helping that the police are attacking healthcare workers right now. On the police's side, like it's one of the worst possible things they could be doing. I mean, it's bad enough that they're targeting old people and young people and defenseless people and really, really being violent in the street and causing all kinds of problems. But the expected consequence of this sort of thing happening is the next article here quote nurses are supporting injured black lives matter protesters with first aid care and uh, i don't think this was actually the article i was thinking of linking to but yeah I th I'll, I'll have to dig it up later but the the point is there have been nurses coming out of the hospitals and joining the protests now and so they'll be working at the hospital probably pulling like a 16-hour shift if i know nurses shifts if they're anything like the shifts here they're quite long they're exhausting they are hard, it's hard work doing the work that they do. And they do this and they leave the hospital. Then they join the protest all night. And then they go back and they go back into the hospital. And like these nurses must be like getting totally out of their mind exhausted, but they're doing this because again, the nurses are getting attacked. The healthcare workers are getting attacked. They're getting, I haven't, can't verify that they're getting arrested yet or not, but this is the sort of thing that's happening in the States right now during a global pandemic, during an event where we need the healthcare workers of all the countries in the world to not be attacked. It is really crucially important that we get this under control. And at the very least, the nurses have to be respected. Obviously they're not being, so there, there has to be some kind of consequence for that. I'm gonna leave that open for the imagination because it is isn't the end of the show. And I do have one more song to play. So as usual, if you've enjoyed this show, the there is a subscribe star that you can throw a coin or two at. It would be helpful in my own world to do things like pay the rent. It is very helpful to have something to rely on there, but uh, I am going to leave with a, another song, AMPM, Padre de Lord. Hopefully I will see you all next week and thank you for listening. La 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 la